Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. So I am here with a business powerhouse today. Let me introduce you to Candy Valentino. She started her very first business just out of high school and with only a high school diploma. She started, scaled, and successfully sold businesses in pretty much every industry, including creating a debt-free eight-figure real estate portfolio. She founded a nonprofit when she was 26, which she's been involved in for over 15 years and has saved thousands of lives and personally raised millions of dollars. During her two decades as an entrepreneur, she has been named top business leaders, 40 under 40, top 50 women in business, and 10 people making a difference, to name just a few. She has had clients from eight-figure CEOs to members of Congress. Candy has bootstrapped, hustled, and persisted her way to creating a life of meaning and purpose. But today, we are not talking about how to grow a business. We're talking about what happens when you're a high achiever like Candy and you're faced with divorce. So, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Renee. Oh, I'm so excited for you to be here. And we are talking about something that's a little bit outside of what you typically talk about. And it's your personal life. And I think it's, I'm so grateful that you're going to be vulnerable and actually share this um, for one of the first times because it's not what you've talked about. So where did you start? How did, how did, where were you when it looked like you were facing a divorce? So, oh gosh, well, I think to give a little bit of backstory, um, my, um, I met a man that was 13 years my senior and being um, very independent and successful, I thought it was very difficult to find someone that aligned with the same things that I was into and certainly knowing my age because I started so young, I really didn't have anything in common with most men my age. So it was a natural progression that I kind of found um, somebody older that had also had achievements and success, right? So that was kind of the beginning part of it. And um, as far as like what what I was thinking about when faced with the divorce, I think it was more of less, there were so many things, right? I think that when, when that comes before us, we feel loss, we feel grief, we feel embarrassment, we feel guilt, we feel so many different things. Um, being super positive, being an overcomer, I am not one to give up easily, which is a great attribute. And it's also can be your detriment. <laughs> um, I did not want to give up. I wanted to make things work. Obviously you talked about my nonprofit. I'm a rescuer, rescuer by nature. So I was trying to rescue a situation, rescue a person. So I think in the beginning, if, if I just had to summarize the feelings that I was experiencing when facing a divorce, those would probably be some of them. All, all of the, uh, the lost feelings that we go through when we start to realize that this isn't what we thought it was going to be. Mm. And I think it's interesting because you are someone who's a doer and an achiever. You've spoken on stages. You surround yourself with really powerful people. You're, you are a powerful person in your own right. But that, that moment when you recognize that, okay, this isn't working, like something isn't working. I think it's our, like any type A, any high achiever, it's our, our instinct is to be like, okay, no, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to control this into working. Like, how did you reconcile that this was something that just might be outside of your control? So it was not without effort. Um, and that, that actually was part of the embarrassing part of it yeah. too, because I stayed so long and tried for so long because I didn't want to give up. Um, that actually made it worse then, because then you're integrated in a community, you're seen together. Um, you know, I was very visible with the charity work I was doing and the business work. So then he became very, so there, there was a lot of those things that like started to become more difficult the longer I extended it. Um, but I just think that it, it was one of those things I had to really identify and this took a long time to get here, but the breaking point, the tipping point for me was the pain of what was, was finally greater than all of the pain of the unknown. And because, you know, when you're in a, a financial situation and, um, and you do have your own success, it's not like you have someone can ruin you financially or you're depending on, I didn't, I was fortunate. I didn't have that. We didn't have kids. So there were a lot of uh, good things in there too. But when they, they can't control you that way, they'll try to find another way. Right. And it'll be, I'll ruin you. I'll ruin your reputation. I'll ruin what people think of you. And 
that starts to think through. But I believe the tipping point was created. I'll, I'll never forget the day where it was just like the pain of whatever is going to become will not be greater than staying in this staying in this environment any longer. And I think that's the tipping point for anyone in anything in their life, whether it's their relationship, their divorce, their business, their job, you know, whatever, uh, a family situation. At some point, the pain of what you know is actually far greater than you really consciously understand. And it's like that feeling of you becoming used to what is until you're actually out of it and you look back, and I'm sure you've had so many other people that have been on it, you've interviewed have said, said it same sentiment, but it's like until you get out of it and look back, you really don't understand how bad it was yeah. because it just becomes your life. And we as women, I think, are just survivors and overcomers and make the best of things. And, and I think that we do that far too long in a relationship when we instinctively know something's off. Absolutely. Did you struggle with any shame or embar embarrassment around your divorce? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because, you know, I was uh, raised in the church. Um, you know, even though my parents got divorced, they divorced very later on. It's just a uh, small town. You know, everybody yeah. talks. And I just think that we're in a society that perpetuates this, you know, and it, it's a shame. But if you think about it, like people that are still married, yeah. that have kids, that ha from the outside have this beautiful life, but the guy travels all the time and has a secret life. And the female goes out to the bar every single yeah. weekend that she can get with her girlfriends and talks crap on her husband. Like that is okay. Like we've normalized that in a society yeah. that that's an acceptable relationship to be in, but realizing that your mental health and that your life is worth more than, and you don't want to be in a relationship that you talk crap about someone and have to be away from them 50% of the time or whatever that yeah. looks like, that's not okay. And that needs to change. I think that's what keeps people stuck in the relationships that they're in and in the, I mean, and it's just not, we're not talking a bad situation. I mean, we're yeah. talking about narcissistic, abusive, toxic situations. It's not just, oh, we had a disagreement. Mm. That's one thing, you know, I, I'm never one to say, don't be a quitter, but at the same time, yeah. realize when you need to quit, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and don't stay longer than it's, um, positively affecting your life anymore. Yeah. I, I think there are so many people out there who stay exactly because they don't want, they don't want to have to tell family or they don't want to have that perception of something's broken in their life. And right. it's so sad because our life is so, so short and we only have such a short period of time to grasp joy and happiness. And why are we delaying that? Like, why are we putting it right. on hold? So, um, yeah, I so appreciate what you said. You and I had spoke previously and you said back in 2019, you were going on stage and you had this like moment that you said that you were physically changing for him. Can you share what that, what that means? Yeah. So it was actually, it was in uh, 2017. I was about to step on stage. Um, and it was actually before that. 2017 was my acknowledgement mm -hmm. of how much I had changed yeah. prior to that. I was changing all along the way because I do believe we can change. We can evolve. Yeah. We can become better humans as things go. It's not that like what we know and think right now is absolute or forever or even right necessarily forever. Right? So I was all about evolving and changing it as a human. And I've done so since I was 15 years old until now. Um, what I didn't realize though was the changing wasn't evolving. It was actually me becoming what somebody else wanted me to yeah. be. It was me relinquishing power. It was me changing to literally be more meek, more quiet, more timid. Yeah. That is not me. It wasn't me when I met him. And that's what was um, sexy and interesting because I was different than everyone else, right? But this is the interesting thing. They like you because you're different than yeah. everybody else, but then try to change you to become who they want you to be. And so when you're dating someone older, I was only 23 years old when we started dating. When I was dating someone older, you then think wisdom and that they know some things. And Okay, I can change. I can evolve. So you try to be flexible, and then you ignore red flags. Yeah. So I had been changing all along the way. What I did not realize was in it wasn't an evolution. It was me shifting and becoming someone that I was not created to be. And it was an incongruence in myself that I could not explain. I couldn't put my finger on, but it felt like an, an inner civil war that was constantly going on. I know looking back that that was me, my heart, my soul, everything that, that who I am and who God created me to be 
was at war with this other entity that was trying to make me who they wanted me to be. And it really took a lot of wisdom and time to sort through that. But stepping on stage in 2017, there were, you know, a, a, a lot of things that happened prior to that. Um, uh, things were very tumultuous. We, you know, were very argumentative. We knew things were coming to an end at that point. And I didn't want him to be a part of this event that I was going to. And instead, uh, he made the decision on his own, even though I told him not to, to still fly out across the country and show up there and, um, you know, wanted to force himself into that situation, even mm. though it wasn't, you know, good for either of us. So it became a very, it was basically the um, boiling point because then what happened was now my embarrassing moment was on display for all of these people that I know, liked and trusted, all of these people that respected me. Now it's like you're going on stage to talk about how to change your life and you literally have like this crazy person that's trying to like circle this, the the uh, ballroom to see when you're walking out and we had to get security. I mean, it was just a disaster. That was a whole other level of embarrassment yeah. because now here I am the powerful woman that has this like awful relationship that I wouldn't wish on anybody. Yeah. I would certainly not want my daughter to be in a situation like that. Right. So that was the, that was the pivotal moment where I was like, a, a flips, uh, a switch flipped. And it was like, no more. Like, I will not be the abused woman. I am not going to like, I will not be perceived as that. Um, and then it was literally instantly like, this has got to go. And I was hoping that it could end, um, through mediation and very positive, like, you know, we didn't need to, to mix, you know, he was respected in the community. I was respected. Like there was no need for it to be nasty, but Unfortunately, when people can't control what they want, and that's a big button issue for them, if they can't control it, then they lash out and react. Um, and it was obviously very nasty and toxic, like I'm sure most of your clients. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and this is this is why this conversation is so important, because for everyone listening, Candy is a, I mean, she is legitimately a powerhouse, like has spoken in front of thousands and thousands of people, takes the stage, like she is unstoppable. And you found yourself in such a toxic relationship that it changed you. And I think that that was my second marriage, like you described it to a T. And it was a really short marriage for me, but it was like, you know, the, the impact after people were like, well, I don't understand how you let that happen. It's like these relationships happen to even the most successful woman out there and people, not just women men too, but you find yourself in that where all of a sudden it's like they take the power away. And you start yeah. becoming that the lit, the light starts to get dim. And so that your story of being in a toxic relationship, like this isn't just for someone who's weak, like, you know, and you hear like, we'll hear like, oh, only weak women will allow this to happen. And that's not true at all. And I think that that's why um, I'm so grateful that you're sharing this story, because there are so many people who are the CEOs, the executives, the breadwinners, the you know, the, the powerhouses too, who are in these unhealthy relationships. And, you know, just to have that inspiration to be like, okay, it's okay to walk away and not blame yourself yeah. that you right. changed because of that. Yeah. And there's two things that I've always, that I've identified. So one, it's a slow fade yeah. is what I call it. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're on a date and someone, and you know, you say something and a guy just hauls off and hits you, you're yeah. like, what the hell? I'm not and you leave. Mm -hmm. But that's not what happens in relationships. It's a slow fade. It's an yeah. evolution. And the better the manipulator, the better they are at doing that. Yeah. Right. I know you talk a little bit about narcissism too. Like the more that the, the person is crafted, that they've become that, mm -hmm. that, uh, personality type forever, the better they are at doing it. So it's a slow fade. It's not like, I want you to dress different because yeah. everybody, people would be like, well, no, I'm not dressed. Like you tell me to dress different. I'm be like, no. But if you do it over time, like, oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't wear that. Oh, really? Like, then you're like, oh, right. Like, cause that would be something like a girlfriend would say, I don't know. Maybe that's not appropriate for this environment. Oh, okay. So I'll change. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a slow fade. It's not this like one off, like uppercut that comes across that we all know. And then because we're ignoring all those little signs along yeah. the way, that's when we start to have the guilt yeah. that, and to me, that is, that is the uppercut because that's when you start to then want to hide and fake. I used to call put on a mask. Mm -hmm. Like we would literally be all out war inside of a car yeah. and then pull up. 
hey guys, how, you know, and it would be just yeah. like a switch would flip your, your mask would go on. You would go into the event or go into the party or do whatever and almost completely dissociate from what yeah. was just occurring. Um, and so then it's like, it becomes ingrained in just the culture of your relationship and that dynamic. And so it's really tough to then break out of that because yeah. you become used to that. But for anyone struggling, and, and the only reason I really wanted, really wanted to share my story was I know how many women and there weren't many that I that really knew because I would always try to make things better than they were. Yeah. But for the women that could see it, the wise women that could see through all of the crap and for them to realize, like, this is not normal. Like, yeah. you know, the, this that just happened is not healthy. That's not love. This is not a good relationship. Yeah. It took me so long to, like, allow all of that to stack up. So my hope is just that maybe someone that is struggling that is trying to stick it out or trying to stay in it for the kids or because they're embarrassed or whatever the reason is that this is maybe just one more stack on that layer. And that maybe this is the boiling point mm -hmm. that you will be okay. Like when you actually realize that that decision, we all make mistakes. Yeah. Don't put so much weight. Like we can make a mistake and color our hair wrong. Right. We can make a mistake by picking the wrong guy. Like don't give it more weight than what it is. It's just a choice that you made. It was a mistake. Yeah. So what? Like the greater mistake is staying once you acknowledge that it was a mistake or that it is toxic. And for those that stay because of the kids, I would offer this. Don't stay because of the kids. Leave so that you can show your kids what it's like to stand yeah. up for yourselves. Leave so that your kids can see what a loving relationship is. Leave so that your kids can actually see their mom or their dad happy and yeah. thriving. The example that you set to your kids is far greater than them thinking that their parents are divorced. My parents divorced. I grew up fine. My dad has a girlfriend that he, it, it is a much healthier relationship mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful that they have it, but it's the macro. People sometimes put too much weight on that macro and they don't really think about like what can occur by making the right choice. Your circumstances of what you're dealing with now is not forever mm. and they don't have to be unless you choose them to be so i would just some some thoughts of maybe anybody that's going through or struggling now you had said on one of your posts that everything you desire is on the other side of your greatest challenge what does that mean to yes. you so i feel that the breakdown comes right before the breakthrough every single thing that you hope that you desire all of the challenges that you're facing now is because you are not going after your greatest fear. And so for me, that was my greatest fear. What's everyone going to think? Yeah. What's everyone going to say? How is this going to affect my business to have all, because I knew once it shifted and it wasn't his controlling the narrative mm. that it was going to get ugly. So how bad is it going to be? Is this going to negatively affect the nonprofit that I worked 15 years to build? Like all of those things go through your mind. And even though of course, there's a moment where, yes, it's difficult, it's painful, it is toxic. I would go through it all over again to have the life that I have now, the freedom that I have now, the love that I have now, the creativity. Like, I no longer have to worry about going to the gym and getting a comment. Like, I don't even want to share them because they're not even appropriate for the air, but yeah. like, just not have to worry about that or that somebody just comes up to says, Hey, I adopted a dog from you. He's doing really good. And it's a guy. And then I got to hear about who was that uh, yeah. he adopted a dog. Oh, he probably just wanted to screw you. Like, like I don't ever have to worry about it. it is, it is the greatest relief of my life to just live. And freedom is something that we all get the choice to have. Like we all can have it, but if we're in a relationship, we, we don't have creative freedom or control of our decisions or of our bank account or of our yeah. right to work. I know that there's all kinds of crazy stories out there of women that what they've dealt with and men too. Um, but the power is yours. Like yeah. you, you just have, you gave it away. I gave it away for far too long. And when I finally took it back and remembered what it was like to feel it, then it was like a muscle that like atrophied for a little bit, but yeah. I just kept pumping it and pumping it. And then that, that muscle got more powerful and stronger than ever. I'm more financially successful than I've ever been. I do. I mean, I, I can't even tell you the load that has been lifted off of my life. And I don't say that to impress anyone. I just say it to impress upon them that this could be the greatest decision of not only your life, but even for your family, even if it's the hardest decision. And it will be, it really yeah. will be. And if you have kids, my, 
Um, I'm engaged now to an incredible guy, and he talks a lot about custody and divorce. He was a divorce attorney, and now he just basically helps people that are going through it, like from a coaching standpoint. Um, and like to have him go through something so difficult with with kids, and I only share this because of the kids. A lot of times people discredit me because I don't have kids, but I watched you know, some of the things that he dealt with going through it, his kids are doing phenomenal. Like, so yes, there's going to be a painful period, but our brains can only measure loss. And I think that's really important to know. Our brains can only measure what we're going to lose. It, it literally biologically cannot measure what we're going to gain. Mm -hmm. So you're focusing on all these things you're going to lose, like the family picnics and the get togethers, but you have no idea what you're going to gain by letting go of something that is just been challenging you for far too long that you acknowledge. So that your greatest next step, your best move is on the other side of that, which you fear the most. Yeah. And there is just in believing in that, you know, so many people will say that they don't believe that they can ever be happy or they don't believe that they'll ever be desirable to somebody else or be able to date again or find somebody else. And I agree with you. Like you have no idea what's on the other side, but you have to close that door first. Yes. You can't 100%. leave. You can't leave with one door still open and think you're going into something else, like all set up. Like you have to close it, heal. And then yes. all of that good comes into your life. Cause if you don't, you're going to take all of that yeah. pain and all of that trauma into the next relationship and not even yeah. realizing it wasn't cause you took the time to heal yourself first. Right. So I think that is so important that you said, and, and also this is another thing, but like there are 7 billion people in the world. Yeah. Like, Seven billion. And a lot of times we live in our tiny little bubble of our tiny little town and the little PTA group that everyone's involved yeah. in. But to think that you're not going to find someone else, like facts are not feelings. So when you start to have feelings pop up in your life, like, oh, I'm never going to find anyway. Okay, let's go with the facts. Yeah. <laughs> the fa that's your feeling. But the facts mm -hmm. are there's seven billion people in the world. The facts are pretty much, I would assume, everybody that you know, maybe a few people that you can think of that got divorced, aren't remarried or aren't with someone, but on an alarming amount have found someone else. Yeah. <laughs> so that is just your feelings, and that's fear. That's all that is yeah. is a fear that's giving you a scapegoat to get out. So I think that's really important, too, that facts are aren't feelings. Make sure that when you're checking your feelings and a lot of times people think, I don't know if I can do this. I can't go through that. I know so many people that have said that to me. And this is what I always offer them. I want you to take out a sheet of paper and I want you to start writing every single thing that you've accomplished or overcame that were challenges and adversities in your life. If you were abused as a child, if you had a really poor upbringing, if you lost a parent, if you lost a child, you birthed children, like yeah. people, like you birth the life and if that baby's alive, like that's a huge yeah. accomplishment in its own. Right. I mean, there's so many things that people have done. You've gone to college, you, you figured out a way to go to law school. You started a business, yeah. right? Write down all of those things that you've actually done in your life. So that when that fear creeps up again and someone tells you, or you tell yourself that you can't do this or that you're not good yeah. enough or that you won't find anyone that you review that list and remember who you are. I think that's really powerful for people to go through as an exercise. I think there are so many powerful sound bites in everything that you've said so far. So let me ask you, have you had any regrets? Do you look back at that relationship and say that you regretted it or wouldn't have done it over again? Uh, that's a, so I truly live my life by the, the feeling of no regrets that we're all on a journey. We're all yeah. on a process. And I do believe that I had to learn so many yeah. things about myself, um, through that. And I got, even though it took my strength and my, took my power away, it ended up giving me massive amounts of power yeah. to know that if I can get through that, my greatest fear, I can accomplish anything. Mm. So for me, as much as I would love to say to you and my logical brain says, yes, I regret not leaving sooner. Yes. Yeah. I regret not acknowledging the first red flag six weeks in six yeah. weeks in to dating. But I also just trust that there is a higher power controlling all of this and that I needed to go through it as long as I did in order to grow and heal. And I think when we're dealing with pain and suffering and it's by our choosing I think that's, and really that's what it is. If, yeah. if we know that we're dealing with pain and abuse and we're not leaving, we're actually choosing it. And I know that's tough for people to hear yeah. right now, 
But if you're still in something that you know is toxic and it's not a great environment, it's not healthy, you're choosing it. So I think for, for me, when I realized that I was choosing it and looking back, I chose it too long. There's still so many lessons in that yeah. that I wouldn't trade for. So yes, I, gosh, I wish I wasn't divorced at 39 and I wish I would have been, you know, single at 24. Cause I would have had a heck of a lot of fun, yeah. but I probably would have made some really bad decisions, honestly. So I just look at it as like life and the yeah. journey and that there are really lessons in it. And if you do that and you look at it that way, then you really don't have regrets. But it does take, I can tell you, some some healing in order to get there and have that view. Everyone I ever ask that question has a similar version of that answer. And I feel the same way about it. And so it's, you know, you can't look back and say, oh, I, I made a mistake. And it was, in, and again, blame yourself. Like there is, if you really dig deep, there are lessons there. And there's so yeah. much growth that comes from that so moment. Much. Like I wouldn't be sitting here, you and I wouldn't be having a conversation, quite frankly, if I didn't go through my divorces. I would just right. be carrying on as a divorce lawyer and not have something more to share. So I think yeah. that there is, there's just so much, so much to learn from our life. And that's what our life is. It's like a messy roller coaster. Like we have ups and downs. We're just along for the yeah. ride. And, and I think that we're all, I, I truly believe too, that we're all here to give and to contribute. Yeah. And if we don't first have someone that's also been through and kind of like been through and paved the way and felt that process you know, I know for me dealing with certain things in my life, if it wasn't for hearing somebody else like, okay, well, that person was abused yeah. and look at what they do. Right. So it's also, if we weren't through this experience, you and I, we wouldn't be sharing it with other people to help them heal and overcome it and face that adversity. So I think that if you look at it through that lens, I think it gives you a lot of peace on your journey, just knowing that you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Mm, absolutely. So I can't let this interview end without at least talking just a tiny little bit about what you do professionally. Cause I know that some of my listeners are going to be like, all right, who is she? Like, I want to follow her. <laughs> And um, there's certainly some high achieving listeners um, who I also think can benefit from everything that you do. So can you just talk a few minutes about your professional work that you do? Yeah. So you touched on it earlier. Um, I started my first business at 19 with no money, no internet. I grew up super poor, um, trailer, two teenage parents, and just figured out my way um, and also had no plan B. So it was like whatever mm -hmm. I needed to do built and scaled multiple businesses and had my last exit in 2019. And after I had that, I had wanted to move for 15 years, but at the time my husband didn't want to move. And so I ended up staying and just continued to, you know, build businesses and buy real estate and do all that stuff. So I moved in 2019. I took some time off and I was like realizing that there was a lot of bad information on the internet and on social media when it came to building businesses. A lot of people were talking about businesses. However, they had never actually built a business mm -hmm. prior to talking about building a business. And I was like, hmm, that's really strange. Like this person actually never hired employees, never bought a building. Yeah. Like, so I was just kind of watching it from afar and I really didn't want to get into the space for that reason. Cause I didn't want to get muddied yeah. under that umbrella. And then the more I was watching, I was just like sharing a couple tips um, on social and I just kind of this community came to me because they knew it was different. It felt different. It sounded different. So I started doing um, high level uh, consulting for business owners, business owners that are maybe stuck at seven figures. The ones, the threes and the eights are always tough. So if you're at a 1 million, 3 million, 8 million, or if you're at 100,000, 300,000, 800,000, it's tough to break through to that next one, three mm -hmm. or eight. So I help and develop programs for entrepreneurs at every level. Um, it's taken me some time because I'm not a teacher, right? Just like you, yeah. like when you do something, you do it. You don't teach it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it was, it was so tough for me to like, okay, wait, so what do I do? Right? Like people were like, how do you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just instinct after 23 yeah. years. Right? So it took some time to like extract the information to teach it. So now I have business accelerator programs for early founders. I have um, high one, high level programs for high level executives and, and owners and founders. Um, we have an event coming up here in Scottsdale in October. So really anything to grow your business and by growing your business, it's also growing your life. Like I always say, it's not just scaling your business. We need to scale your life. Yeah. Like 
accumulating all of this, creating an audience, making money, that's all great because it gives you options, right? But it's really not what life's all about. Yeah. So um, it's really where we kind of evolve the whole process into business and philanthropy and giving back and what all that looks like and how to generate more wealth so that you can do more of all of those things. So um, I have a, a – um, it's basically called Founders, and it's basically all the different programs for business owners under that as well. And then I speak, and um, I was just in Utah speaking to 175 high-performing chiropractors, which was super awesome, on how to scale their business and mm-hmm. their life, too. So uh, I love this so much. Like, that's my other, aside from talking about divorce, talking about business and entrepreneurship and marketing, it's like, it's it lights me up. It is so much fun. I love doing it. I love growing the business. I love pivoting and kind of disrupting the industry standards. So yes. so much fun stuff. I love so it. So cool. Yeah. So Candy, how do we follow you? Where do we find you? How do we connect with you? So my biggest platform is on TikTok, which has only been the last few months. <laughs> um, I posted a business tip that went viral and just developed this community. So I'm on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook, all as Candy Valentino. Um, or you can find me at candyvalentino.com. And then uh, information about the founders, events, and organization, all of that will be uh, on there as well coming up soon. So, And, of course, I'll put all the links in the show notes. So final question, what is next for you? Mm, this new um, – this event and this whole community, there is some really exciting things happening. Um because of being a founder at such an early age and loving entrepreneurship so much, we're going to be expanding into Founders School and Founders University mm-hmm. in order to help kids that are between 5 and 13 and then 13 That's and cool. 23 to really be able to develop their skills, their financial literacy, teaching them marketing, and even if they don't want to build a company, how you interact in the business world and all of that. So I'm pretty pumped up about that. Um, I love mentoring like youth, and I think I'm just young enough yet to kind of be relative. <laughs> like I'm, I'm crossing over, but <laughs> so I'm like, we got to do this quick, guys, before you know. <laughs> so, but yeah, so that's I'm pretty excited about that. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being vulnerable and for sharing your story. It is so important, and you just said so many wise things. So I know some people out there are nodding their head and saying, "Oh my God, that's my story." So, thank you oh. for being another voice in this space. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.